Si te pego un beso, me dámelo. Te sé que estás besando. Llevo un tiempo y me dámelo. Cambié de estar, me dámelo. Sabes que tu corazón conmigo te hace bam bam. Sabes que esa beba está buscando de mi bam bam. It's nice to be here. Um, I have to warn you, I am not going to be talking about uh, Web3 or crypto or AI. I'm going to be talking about really boring, just Git command line bullshit. So I hope that you guys use Git on the command line, because otherwise this is going to be a pretty boring talk, and it's a little bit nerdy. But uh, I've been giving talks on Git for, I don't know, 15 years now, for, for sort of as long as I've been professionally using Git. And I've been talking about Git again more recently, I've been doing it for a long time, but more recently I found out that a lot of people have been using, how many people, raise your hands if you've never used anything other than Git as a version control system. Okay, so this is a different generation than when I first kind of was giving talks like these, and so I thought it was kind of interesting that Git can do a whole bunch of things that you may not know about. Now, <clears throat> I called this talk, So You Think You Know Git, but actually it's So You Think You Know Git Part 2. Did anybody see my FOSDEM version of this talk? Okay, okay. So. I didn't want to do the exact same talk that was kind of my plan. You go and you give talks and you don't, you know, you can give talks multiple times, but uh, my other talk kind of got a lot of views on YouTube and so I didn't want to give the same talk again. So this is actually, uh, so you think you know Git part two, Git revenge. <clears throat> um, it's exactly the same format as the other one, so if you like this talk, you can go on YouTube and watch another 45 minutes of the same exact type of thing, but I'm not covering any of the same topics. So it turns out that there's a lot of dumb shit that Git does, and I can talk for hours about it. Um, so a little bit about me. I was one of the GitHub co-founders. Um, I wrote the Pro Git book. If you read the, uh, you know, if you go to the Git website and read the book, that, that was my sort of open source book. Um, and now we're working on a new Git client. Um, which is available on GitHub, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But I've been working in Git for a really long time, and I found it really interesting how many things it can do um, and that you probably don't know. So there's more than 145 commands in Git. Um, there was actually one introduced in the last release this week called Git Replay, which I'm not going to talk about today because it's a little bit boring. But they, they, there's just keep coming up with new commands. So there's a lot of them you probably don't know. There's still an average of 10 commits, 9 commits a day, every day every year, so there's always more stuff going into Git, but most of you probably learn five commands and you use those same five commands and you don't kind of go outside of that. <laughs> Everybody's nodding, they're like, I do know those five commands. Um, so there's 10,000 commits in the last three years. What has been happening, right? How much of this do you actually know? So I'm just gonna give you a bunch of stuff that Git does today that you may not know about. I'm gonna just do it as a shotgun buffet of, of here's a bunch of stuff that I'll talk about today. Um, if you don't want to take notes, if anything you find is interesting, I put these slides up at um, the blog at Git Butler, so you can go and find the slides and look up any of this stuff. So just try to see if there's anything that catches your attention, and then you can go look it up later, or we can talk about it over beers tonight. Um, okay, so I'm just going to hit them. One is there's some new commands in Git called switch and restore. Does anybody use switch or restore? Handful of people. Okay, so one of the things that's sort of problematic about Git that people have been complaining about for a long time is that checkout is very overloaded. So you can do a lot of stuff with checkout. So you can switch branches, checkout branch. You can revert a file, check out the file that'll revert it to whatever it, the, the version is in the index. You can revert a file to an older version of the file. If you say, here's an old commit, make the file look like it looked like in that commit instead of what it looks like it now. You can also, I don't know if you know this, you can patch checkout files. So if you do checkout-p, it'll do this interactive thing and it'll say, do you want to revert this hunk and this hunk and this hunk? You don't have to do the entire file, which is kind of cool. Um, but again, it's checkout and none of these things are really checking out anything, right? <laughs> it's reverting stuff, it's switching stuff. So git kind of put these new porcelain commands in that just wrap this. So instead of writing git checkout branch, you can say git switch branch and it'll switch into that branch. And they've renamed some of the options to it so you can say dash C, which is essentially like git checkout dash B. It's create a new branch and switch to it, right? Um, 
I don't know what dash C stands for. It could be create, it could be cat, who knows, right? Like the people who write Git have some interesting ideas from time to time, so it could stand for pretty much anything. But switch is one. The other is restore. So instead of saying git checkout file in order to restore the contents, you can say git restore file, and it does exactly the same thing, essentially. It's just, they just try to make it so it's a little bit easier for new users to say, don't learn these five things that checkout does, learn these ones that are a little bit more domain specific, and the options have changed to be a little bit more clear what they're, what they're doing. So if you want to restore from an older commit, you can say dash dash source and, and then do it from that file and that'll work too. And the dash P and, and a couple of the other commands, but it just splits it up. So if you're teaching somebody Git today, you might want to teach them switch and restore rather than check out and all of the different things that it does. Um, if you want to remember what these are, these are all the different things that you can do with restore, check out, switch and reset. Check out and switch, you can switch branches. Restore and check out, you can undo unstage changes. Restore and reset, you can undo stage changes. Reset and switch, you can move the head reference. And all of them, you can actually accidentally delete shit in your working directory. So be, you know, just if you need to remember that, this is a handy guide for you. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is hooks. How many of you use hooks in your Git repositories? So there's lots of things you can do with hooks. I don't know if you know how many hooks there are. There are 28 hooks that you can use in Git. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of them. I just want to talk about, actually, let's get rid of the email stuff. I assume most of you aren't sending email patches to mailing lists. Let's get rid of the per Perforce Bridge stuff. You probably don't care about that. Let's get rid of the server stuff. You're probably not running your own server, right? You're probably using GitHub or something. Um, and Microsoft introduced a bunch of uh, large repository scaling stuff that has some hooks in it that, that even they don't really use anymore. So what we're really looking at is these 11 hooks. So you can do stuff around your commits, you can do stuff around rewriting or like rebasing or merging, and you can do stuff around switching branches or pushing. Um, but you probably don't want to go into .git slash hooks and write your own your own scripts. Um, you can do that. That's how they're, they're, That's how Git tries to use them. But there's better ways of using hooks that are much more interesting. So these are some examples of what you can do with hooks. You can help with commit message formatting. You can install packages after you change something. You can update C tags, right? <clears throat> and switch to tabs or spaces. You can lint stuff. You can make sure you're not committing large files. There's all sorts of stuff you can do with hooks. Um, but there's two things that I've seen used that, that I think are really valuable now, which help with managing hooks. One is a, a package called pre-commit, and the other one's a package called Husky. Um, pre-commit, essentially, you install this, this program. You create a YAML file that says, here's the hooks that I want to do. So you're not putting the files in. You're saying, here's uh, how I want, what hooks I want to run. And then you install this thing. And then every time that you commit after that, it'll run those. And the, the, commit, the YAML file looks like this, which is kind of cool. So it's almost like a gem file or something. It points at a repository and says, this repository has a whole bunch of hooks that are defined in it. And these are the IDs of the hooks from that repository I want you to run when I'm, when I'm doing stuff. And they can hook into any of these parts of, of your work cycle. Um, so you can say, OK, these are sort of the standard ones and some of the, the hooks I want to run. And then I have this other one called, called black in there. And then when you commit, it has this nice output. And it says which ones ran and which ones passed and which ones skipped and stuff like that. And since the YAML files in your repository, everyone on your team can share them and use them as well, which is, which is much nicer than trying to pass hooks around to people and have them, have them use it. Um, and then the other one is Husky, which is very similar. It's just it's an MPX thing, and you can keep your hooks in a .husky file, and anybody who runs that, it'll run those hooks. So mainly, this is valuable for sharing hooks with other people on your team um, and making sure that everybody's running the same linters or the same hooks when they're running stuff. Um, the next one I want to talk about is attributes. How many of you have a .git attributes file in your repository? I'm getting less and less. Fewer and fewer people doing these fun things with Git. So attributes is a way of telling Git certain things about file extensions in your, in your repository. So I'll give you a real dumb example um, that I think you know, at least shows you what it's capable of doing. If you do git diff and you have two images and git sees it as a binary file, it won't show you the difference between the images, right? It can't really do that. It says it's binary. I can't do a diff on this like I can with a text file. So I just say, hey, they, they're different. But something you can do is you can run files through an intermediate and then diff that. So for example, you can use something called exif tool on an image. It'll give you some metadata about an image. And then you can say, if anything that ends in .png, use this exif diff tool 
And what the exif diff tool is just run exif tool, right? And so what it'll do is it'll run it through that and then diff the output of that. So instead of saying A and B differ, it'll say here's a difference in the metadata of the files, right? Which is not the difference in the files exactly, but it's more useful than A and B differ. So it just gives you an idea of some stuff that you can do. And how this works is it runs things through called smudge and clean filters. And so what this does is if you have some files and you say everything in .txt, run it through a smudge, and then it will run it through this program and then put it in your working directory. And then if you say, uh, you know, you add or you commit, it'll run it through another filter before it puts it into your repository. So you can do this on all sorts of stuff. One dumb example would be to implement something like RCS keywords. There's something like half of this audience has never used anything other than Git. But if you're really old, like I am, and you've actually used tools like CVS or RCS, um, they used to have these things where you could put these little headers into your files, and then when you check out the files, it'll fill them out, and then when you commit them, it'll clean them back out again, right? So you can say, here's the version, or here's the last commit, or here's version history, or something like that. Um, so when you check it out, it actually looks like this, but in the source code itself, if you look at it at GitHub, it doesn't have any of this, this data on it, right? Um, so you can do something like this in Git if you wanted to. You could you know, write a, a file that expands the date, and then just say, hey, I have this filter called dater, and the smudge is to run it through this program. The clean is to run it through this Perl expression. And then if you put this string into a file and you say, hey, for everything that, that ends in, in uh, or all of my files, run it through this filter, and then you check it back out, it'll have expanded that out, right? So you could do this type of thing. It's a very simple example that none of you will probably want to do, but it gives you an idea of what you can do. The biggest usage of this is a program called LFS. So if you're using Git LFS, this is how Git LFS works, right? It works with this, with this Git attribute stuff. Um, Git LFS is large files, so if you're working in a gaming industry or you have you know, large gaming assets or something like that, you don't want to put all of that into Git, because then when you clone, you get every version of every large file, and it's not very good at that. So what you do instead is essentially you store pointers in the repository, and then you have these, these smudge and clean filters that check them out and put them back in. So if you use Git LFS, um, and you install it, and you track something, what that does is it updates your git attributes file. And then if you do something like commit a movie file or something like that, it doesn't actually store it in git and push it to GitHub. It um, pushes it to whatever your LFS server is, um, which also can be GitHub, but in a different way. But the actual file that it stores is three lines, right? It's not the entire movie file. It's just sort of this pointer. And then when the, the, clean, when the smudge filter looks at it, it says, hey, OK, you have a smudge filter on this. Here's the SHA. I'll go out to some third-party server. I'll pull down the movie file, and I'll put it in your working directory as though that was what was stored in Git. So that's how LFS works. But again, you can do all sorts of stuff with, with these filters. Another fun thing is fix-up commits. So how many of you use a rebasing type workflow rather than a merging type workflow? OK, so it's 50-50-ish. You guys are wrong, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> but if you do use a rebasing type workflow, um, there's a really cool thing you can do. So one of the things, actually, one of the things that I think GitHub kind of messed up is the way that we do pull requests. It's really difficult. You do your, your commits. You do a nice series. You say, OK, I've documented my three commits and stuff, and they're really nicely documented. And I push them to, to GitHub um, repository and open up a pull request. And now I get feedback. And if I get feedback, and it's feedback on you know, the first commit of the three, it's really difficult to fix it, right? To, to sort of amend that commit and add those, whatever the review is, into that commit. What you usually do is you say, hey, I fixed some review stuff, right? And you add a fourth commit on top, and you, you push it up, because you don't want to force push a branch or something like that. Um, but if you didn't want to do that, if you wanted to say, clean up your series, put the review into the appropriate commits in your history that you had, and be able to fix that up. It's really difficult to do, because what you have to do is you have to sort of interactively rebase and say, stop at each thing, and pull in the new changes, and commit it there, and blah, blah, blah. So Git actually has a really easy way of doing this um, that you probably don't know. I'm actually, sorry, I keep pulling the, I'm curious what audience, who uses fix up and auto squash? Nobody. Half, five people, OK. <clears throat> so. What you can do, if you wanted to do the workflow that I was talking about, is let's say that we have this patch series. We have some branch. It has like five commits on it. Um, that's my nice series. I push it up somewhere. I get some review. Somebody says, hey, add this to the documentation, right? So I can say, OK, I'm going to add something to the documentation. I'm going to commit it. But instead of sort of rebasing and trying to figure out what, where to put it, I can say, commit this, but dash dash fix up, and then I give it 
the SHA of the commit that I want it to be added to, right? So I want to I want to fix up this commit with sort of whatever I've done in this last commit here, and then um, it's just dash dash fix up. There's, there's other things too you can do like reword, and there's a couple different things that you can do. But it's essentially adding to the commit history, and then what it does is it's actually kind of simple. It does this, right? So it just creates a new commit that has a very specific commit message in it that gives git information later. So it does keep adding to the history, but then you can say git rebase dash dash auto squash, and you used to have to do dash i and do this interactively anyways, and it would sort of it would essentially do an interactive rebase, but move things around properly so that it would squash them properly. Um, but right now, you actually don't need to do that. Um, as of six months ago or something, you can say rebase dash dash auto squash, and it will just rebase it. And then if you run git log, you can see that the, all the SHAs changed, right? It actually did rebase your series, but it took every, you can do this with multiple, you can have five or six fix up commits, um, and then auto squash everything, and it, it will do the rebase automatically. Um, if it has problems or something, it'll stop, and you can fix it and, and you know, rebase continue or something, but um, it's actually kind of a really nice workflow if you're trying to keep a, a patch series clean. Um, the other thing, if you're doing a rebase workflow and you're trying to keep your series clean, you can use something called update refs. And the way that this works is if you rebase stacks of branches. So if you're doing stack diffs, if you're using something like uh, um, Fabricator or something like that, right, where you're trying to do stacked branch or stack diff workflows, um, stack branch and stack diffs are essentially you're doing lots of different branches that are kind of on top of each other, right? And so the downside to this, I actually don't use this very much. I don't really love this. Most people do it because it's easier to review sort of on GitHub because it kind of splits up. Because GitHub, you can't really review commits. You can only really review branches. And so people like stacking branches to make them act like commits, right? Which is kind of funny. Um, but if you're doing that and you have these things and you want to change something down at the bottom, the, the downside of this is if you merge in patch one, you just get patch one. If you merge in patch three, you get all three of them, right? They're all dependent. So if you're doing merges or something, it's a little, but it, whatever, it doesn't really matter. If you're doing that and you want to rebase something that's at the bottom of this, um, it's a little bit of a pain in the ass because if you rebase this, what will happen is it's not going to move the references of the other, of the other commits, right? It will just move the reference of whatever the one you were on when you did the rebase. Even though it does rebase the whole series, it doesn't actually move the pointers of the other ones. So recently they introduced, so you can see these are exactly the same ones, but th some of them are kind of, they're off. And so what you have to do then is manually move the pointers yourself, right? Um, I see some people nodding. There's a handful of people that are, most of you are real bored right now about this. I can tell there's like three guys that are like, oh my God. Um, so <laughs> that guy over there is gonna love the other YouTube video too. So, so if you say dash dash update refs, what it will do is essentially what you assume it would do, right? Is, is it says, hey, I saw that there were some references on commits that I just rebased for you, and so I moved them for you, right? So you don't actually have to do that. Um, and so if you do it, it just does what you assume it should do, and it moves the references for you, and it'll move a whole stack. Um, you can also, if you do this, actually, whether you do this or not, it's not a bad thing to just globally add this configuration because honestly it's probably a better default um, but they but get doesn't want to be backwards incompatible so it tends not to you have to add all of these sort of updates um, okay just like two more things scaling git so if you have a huge repository like hundreds of gigabytes right um, or hundreds of thousands or millions of, of uh, files in your working directory there's a whole bunch of work that Microsoft has done, almost exclusively Microsoft has done recently to try to scale Git to run, to be able to do Windows development on Git, right? Um, and all of this stuff has been upstreamed, and so it's all available in Git. Um, but, and, and I talked about this in my other talk a bit. I'm not really going to go into it except to show you a command that ships with Git now. So there's, if you install Git, you get two top level commands. You get Git, and then the 145 you know, subcommands that Git will run. And now you get a second one called Scalar. And Scalar is only used to clone, essentially. Um, in my other talk, I talked about all of the things that it does. I'm not going to talk about any of that other than to say, if you clone with Scalar, it will set up all of your defaults to, to deal with huge repositories by default. That, that is, you don't have to set five other things. Um, so if you're curious, you can. It is, you know, it's a Git command. You can go on Git SEM. Like you can read about about the thing, 
But essentially, all you have to do is say, instead of git clone, you say scalar clone. And it sets it up a little bit differently, but it sets up all this stuff. It sets up prefetching, it sets up commit graph generation, it sets up your file system monitor for fast statting, um, it sets up a partial cloning. You actually won't get all of the files checked out by default. You have to individually say, here's the three subdirectories that I want, um, and it does sparse checkout. So, um, so yeah, anyways, if you have a huge repository, check out Scalar. It could be a, an easier default for, for, for setting up large repositories. Um, and then the last good thing that I'll talk about is work trees. How many of you use work trees? Okay, 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 okay. Work trees, this is because of what I'll talk about next, which is what Git Butler does. I get this type of thing a lot of, why aren't you talking about work trees? And partially it's because nobody really uses work trees, but they can be very, very valuable to some people. So work trees, essentially, it's to enable to let you to work on more than one branch at a time. So if you, for example, this is probably very common, you have a feature, did I, did I set off an alarm? Did I steal something? Um, OK, I'll, I'll wrap up if that's what that is. Um, <laughs> if you want to work on a feature and then you, somebody comes in and is like, hey, we need a bug fix, right? And then you're like, OK, well, now I have to stash everything and kind of create a new branch and switch it and fix it and push it up and stuff like that. Work trees help you not, not need to do that because it allows you to provide a new working directory for each branch that you want to work on at the same time. And so the way that works is very simple. You have a couple branches. You say git work tree add, give it a branch name and a directory, and it will check out that branch into a new directory. And then you can go work on it in that directory. And the cool thing is, if you commit in that work tree, and then you go back to your original one, and you say, what are my branches, it'll show you the branches that you're working on in other work trees, right? So it's a shared object database. You don't have to kind of move objects back and forth. Anything you do in any of them is visible in all of them. So the last thing is, the other way to solve this is with the project that I'm working on, which is called Git Butler, which kind of solves the same problem of working on multiple branches at the same time, except instead of giving you a different working directory for each one, we allow you to do all of them in one working directory, and we just remember what hunks go in which virtual branches and let you commit to them. So it looks kind of like this, where you have a different lane per branch, and you can just kind of drag changes or files from one lane into another, and when you commit, it looks like Essentially, that's the only change that was in that branch. Like, you were on it by itself, right? <clears throat> so it's kind of nice in that all of this is in one working directory. So this is a branch. I can commit. You can see there's a commit thing in each lane individually. So I can commit and change and update and stuff, all of them individually, push. Um, and when I push, um, I get a different branch on GitHub for each one of these, right? So it's kind of like, like stacked branches would be dependent. These are completely independent branches that live together. So it's almost like taking a merge product and then separating it out into branches, right? And the nice thing is, since they all live in one working directory, you know that all of these branches will merge cleanly because it has to, right? Um, and so this is how, how we're working in the project that we're working on. Um, and you can find it on GitHub as well if you're interested in the project. So. That is pretty much it. If you thought that was interesting and want to hear 10 other things, random shit that Git does, um, you can go to our YouTube channel. There's a, there's a video from the, my FOSDEM version of this talk. Um, other than that, let's get a beer tonight. I would love to hear about your workflows, about your Git stuff. Thank you very much, and have a very, very great conference. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Steph.